Hi guys, Jack Spierko here, uh, coming to you from the uh, back porch. It's my outdoor kitchen area, and uh, but what we're talking about today is the 300 gallon uh, aquaponics build that I started this summer that kind of got delayed. And in one of the most recent updates, I think it was update nine, and then I put out like three that were all one day, little short ones. But in episode nine, I said, "Tell me your questions in the comments uh, up to this point in the build, and I'll get answers for you." And I thought that I would take just a moment this morning before I do my podcast and uh, give you the answers to just a few questions that came in. One person asked, when I was doing the soil mix, and this was not in episode 9, this was like 10, 11, uh, somewhere in there, and I was doing the soil mix, and I was using perlite as one of several things to lighten the compost. Would I substitute charcoal for that? Uh, my, You can do whatever you want, like I said, and I think anything that lightens the soil will probably help. However, charcoal's pretty good at taking up nutrients. That's why we use it in aquariums and our filter systems. And of course, in an aquaponics system, we kind of want that nutrient to go into the plants. Now, you're gonna fertilize your, uh, your plants in a wicking bed from the top with organic fertilizers that you'll see in the next episode when we get the mulch layer on and all the things we're gonna do. And biochar, or char which is just charcoal, uh, has has great properties for helping to grow stuff. I don't know that I would want to use it in the quantity that would be necessary to replace perlite in the mixture that I made. It might just be a little too much. It might work fine. I really am not sure. Charcoal, like perlite, like expanded shell, like lava rock, like lava sand, it has an amazing surface area. One little piece of it has just it's ridiculous. Like if I told you what it was and you didn't understand what I was talking about, you wouldn't even believe me. Like the surface area of a piece of charcoal that's that big you can hold in your hand is about the same as the surface area of my house behind me. It's it's really that dramatic because of all the intricacies and in and outs and all the little caves. And it's great for bacteria and stuff like that. And I would think over time is it did whatever it could from a standpoint of nutrient uptake, it would it would stop because that's why we had to change it in aquarium. So I would not use it. In fact, I have a five gallon bucket of biochar we made in a kiln that we uh, trialed here. And I plan on using it as one of the many amendments when I do the top layer and I do the mulching and the fertilizing, all the stuff we're gonna do next. So I'm actually gonna be using biochar here, but I don't know that I would use it, you know, at a ratio of like 10% of the total mix. I just, I don't know that that makes as much sense as using something like a perlite or even a vermiculite or something else like that or even using straight up organic matter like shredded leaves or sphagnum moss or peat moss or something like that. Uh, so what I would not do, I would not use it as the stratification layer because then you literally are filtering uh, all that wonderful fish water. You know, in, a, in an aquarium we want to filter all that stuff out in a and a wicking bed or even an ebb and flow bed, we want that stuff up and into the plants. We want the plants to do the filtering. So I wouldn't use it as a stratification layer. I wouldn't put like a big thick layer of it down there at the bottom. Um, I, I personally just wouldn't do that. But using it in your mix to a smaller degree or using it as a top dressing as an amendment like we're gonna do, definitely would. Uh, next question was, when do you add worms? Pretty much whenever you want. Um, however, I would get your beds full. Uh, because when your beds are full, then you put your worms in there and you're not, you know, mixing it up and cutting your worms up in little pieces and all. But you can add red wigglers and you can add night crawlers to these aquaponic systems, both to the wicking beds and to the ebb and flow beds. It's crazy. Get a big handful of worms and stick them on top of all that lava rock and, uh, and, and expanded shale or whatever you're using and they just go straight down in there. And uh, actually in this system and what I'm going to be restocking a lot of my other systems with, I'm going to night crawlers. I think they're actually going to do better for us. Uh, than red wigglers. Red wigglers really moderate their population, which is a good thing, but they're really more of a compost worm. Uh, so when you get them in the systems without a lot of compost, I don't think that they do as well migrating through soil layers and stuff as, as potentially night crawlers. So we're going to try that and see. Both of them work, uh, but uh, I'm going to give a shot to the night crawlers and see how they do this time around. You can add them anytime you want to. However, if you're ordering them from like Mr. Jim's, you might want to think about when you order them. I just finally went ahead and ordered mine. We're in September. We're having days in the 80s instead of days at 105 degrees. So you might want to think about the time of year you order them. Or if you use Mr. Jim's Worm Farm, they have an option to let, what they'll do is they'll, they'll send them to your post office, whatever your closest post office is, and they'll have them held there and they'll call you like they do with chicks and ducks and stuff like that. 
So if you're going to have to order them in the hottest time of the year, I would take that option. Uh, next was a question about pea gravel. And uh, would you use pea gravel in substitution of expanded shell? I mentioned I use expanded shell because I get it for $90 a yard, and that's really cheap. Uh, no, I would not. Now, I've talked to people that have run aquaponic systems based on pea gravel, sort of Dutch bucket style. They have bunches of buckets, and they have little tricklers that just trickle water into that pea gravel. And they trickle, and the way the people that I've talked to do it, that water trickles for 15 minutes, and then the pump shuts off for half an hour, and then it trickles for 15 minutes, and it shuts off for half an hour. And they seem to have good results with that. Using it in an ebb and flow bed the way that I'm using expanded shale, I think it's going to be a lot more likely to become gummed up and require more maintenance. Uh, using it, I would not mix it into the soil mix the way I did the expanded shale. Expanded shale is a soil amendment. I mean, landscapers everywhere are using this stuff. That's why it's become so widely available. It's, it's again, it's, it's shale, but it's puffed. It's heated up. And when you pick up a big handful of it, if you were to compare it to a handful of pea gravel, it weighs about probably 25% as much as the pea gravel. So it's very light, it's airy, it's designed to absorb water. I wouldn't use pea gravel in that, that, uh, that stratification layer. I would use perlite, I would use um, expanded shell. That's the two things I would probably use. Um, so pea gravel, I think you can use it in specific applications, but in the stuff that I'm doing, I would not personally recommend it. Uh, you could try, if you do an ebb and flow bed based on lava rock and you cap the top two inches with pea gravel, that might work. If I had the ability, I would rather use the, uh, the, the, the Lika, which is the little marble looking clay balls that you guys are accustomed to seeing uh, aquaponics use, or expanded shale because they're lighter and they just really fit that application. If I was gonna try it at all, I would do that top layer only and just be prepared that you may have to, a year into it, pull it off, give up the, the, the pursuit and try something else. It is nice to have any kind of like an easy to work, you know, one and a half, two inches layer on top of ebb and flow beds. Uh, but I would keep your, your pea gravel out. I would just keep it out of your wicking beds. I, I don't think it makes sense. You can get lava rock in bags anywhere and it, I know it can kind of get expensive filling the bottom of your wicking beds, but if you use the perforated pipe, create a false bottom, you use a lot less lava rock, and you're going to have good flow rates, and it's going to cost you less than doing it with pea gravel or anything else. Uh, next one. Somebody said, you know, I was talking about when I was building that, like I know I can fit six beds in there really good. I can almost guarantee I can fit eight of those big four-by-four four beds in there, but I'm not sure I can put ten in there and make them all fit in a way that's aesthetically pleasing to me. I'm kind of married at this point to the concept of symmetry. I want the beds done. I don't want like like two here, two here, and then one here and one over there and one over there. I want them kind of done in a kind of formal, symmetric, cube-like shape. The reason I want to do that shape, first of all, is because, well, the main bed is square. All of the little beds are square. Even the oval-shaped ebb and flow beds are now squared in. So it's kind of got a formal kind of Japanese garden look to it. And those big ugly bins over time, I will facade them in with paneling and it will look very attractive. I want this build to be the thing that when someone comes here and says, well, I have to deal with an HOA looking in my backyard or something, I want, or my wife wants things to be you know, really nice. I want people to be able to look at that and go, you know what, that'll work. If I can build it that way, I can build it that way and make everybody happy. Now, as to why I want to do all 10 of them there, this is zone one in permaculture. You don't want to put your garden, your primary production garden, way out in the back, like where my aviary is, or way out in, in the west pasture where like some of my orchard stuff is and all. You want it where when I walk outside, I look, and there it is. You want a place you walk past it every day. So when there's a weed, you yank it out and give it to the chickens or whatever. And so I want it all centralized because I want this to be my zone one production garden. If it won't work, then yeah, I'll take those two and I'll take them somewhere else and uh, I'll, I'll tie them into another system or something like that. I have that really big 16 by 16 pond I'm going to do. Um, you know, I could end up creating two wicking beds to go with that. I really don't want the complexity there though. I'd like this all centralized to one point, all of it centralized to one drain point for my winners. It's got power right there. I can keep the central pond from freezing up, and I can shut everything else down on our freezing weather. And again, it centralizes what you would think of as your kitchen garden 
in one location. That's why I want all 10. That person also said those, those bins look big enough to grow small trees in. You bet they are. Uh, absolutely. And if you can find a source of them and you want to do some sort of tree-based wicking beds or you just want to stick them somewhere and facade them in and plant trees in them and you know you could do wicking beds that are static plumb to your 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 main line your water line or you could just manually water they would work fantastic for that however if you were going to do that i would say it would probably be more economical to just buy ibc's and cut them in half they're going to be about the same size and if you're going to facade them in it won't really matter um, i got a huge opportunity on these things at 35 bucks a piece if you want to find them, what you're looking for are fiberglass tubs that are used to store molasses for cattle. That's what they are. How many places you can find them, where they are, I don't know. I got lucky. A buddy found them driving around. He bought like 35 or 40 of them or something like that. And he said, do you want 10 for what I paid for them? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I don't know if you'll be able to find them anyway. Uh, and then I have somebody ask me, what is cycling? And I realize that sometimes when we do these channels like this, or these, like my channel's about all kinds of stuff, but when we do these series like this on aquaponics stuff, people have been following us a while. You, we started to just believe that people know what a word means. Uh, well, cycling, if you really wanted to get a, a, a long explanation of it, very well detailed out, just go to Google and type, type, in, it, type in cycling a fish aquarium, because it's the same thing. And what we do with cycling is we introduce life to an aquatic system. And there's a time lag now where bacteria has to build up in enough numbers to, to complete what's called the nitrate-nitrite cycle, right? The nitrite-nitrate cycle. So when the fish pee, just to be blunt, when the fish pee, you've got nitrogen in the form of nitrite. And nitrite is not something your plants can absorb as nitrite. They need nitrate. So over time, you build up enough bacterial colonies in all those rocks and stones and all that surface area that we talk about all the time in a fish tank. You build it up in the aquarium uh, filter system. You bury it up in the you build it up in the gravel layer. All that good stuff, and that bacteria basically nom noms on that nitrite and and changes it into nitrate. And then when it's the nitrate, then you can, your plants can 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 take that up. And the way most people do this is they get an aquarium test kit and they put their fish in there. And then every day they come out and they look at the little test strip and, oh my God, this is skyrocketing and this isn't building up yet. And they worry about it. As I've said before, I take free or cheap fish. In this case, 50 goldfish that cost me like 15 cents a piece. And I throw them in there. And when they stop dying, cycling's completed. It's, it's easy. Or I'll go to a, a local pond throw a cast net, a couple, some bread balls and a cast net a couple times, get 30, 40 little bluegills about that big, throw them in there. When they stop dying, cycling's completed. And I don't test it. I don't worry about it. I watch my fish. I watch how my fish behave. Is it the right way to do it? Yeah, you tell me what's right and what's wrong. Uh, it works. And, and I believe that when you're dealing with these larger, you know, if you're dealing with aquaponic system, you're dealing 100 gallons and above, this system's 300, but by the time you factor in the water that's gonna be in all these other systems, the water that's moving through the ebb and flow, you're talking about a 400, 500 gallon system. These systems become remarkably stable in time, and if you simply observe your fish, if your fish are always gonna eat for you at let's say 530, and they don't eat once, it's probably not a big deal. If they don't eat the next day, you know, throw a little bit in there, they don't eat the first day, don't feed them no more, don't have them eating at night when you don't know about it. And the next day they don't eat, you know, start looking at maybe doing a 20% water change or something like that. And don't stress. Just don't. The cycling is, is something that there's no reason to stress for. When you can go out and buy 50 goldfish for 8 bucks, including tax. When you can go down to the local creek and throw in a, a minnow trap or something like that. Or take a rod and reel and a little piece of hot dog and catch 40 or 50 of these little bluegills in 30 minutes. And throw them in there. And when they die... Here's what I do, guys. When they die, I pull the dead ones out. I pull out some dirt around one of the wicking beds. I stick it down at the root of the plant, and boom, I just fertilize that plant for a season. So anyway, we got some good stuff coming. I'm going to be doing a fertility program uh, that I've been doing a long time, but I've never really documented for you before when we put the mulch layer on these. Uh, I've got one product that I've run out of and didn't realize I did. I'm waiting for it to come in. Uh, by then, I will have both of those beds completely full. I think I got one full, and the other one's like, it needs one more load. So when we get that, I'll be doing the mulch soaking. I'll be using the liquid seaweed, the Dr. Earth fertilizer, some additional fertilizers for diversity, some biochar, 
Um, and we're also going to be doing a, a fungal inoculation, and that's actually the product that I'm working on. I, I, I thought we still had some of the endomycorrhizal fungi, and, and I don't know where, either I don't have it or I don't know where it is. So either way, I ordered some more. That's all coming soon. Keep the questions coming. I'll keep the answers coming. Thank you for subscribing to my channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe now. Click the little thing to get an alert by email whenever I post. And if you like what I do here, you'll probably love my podcast. We cover all kinds of things, not just aquaponics. It's called the Survival Podcast. And you can get there by going to tspc.co. tspc.co. That's not a typo. Dot co. And all the cool kids are doing it. Give it a try. It'll work. I promise you. tspc.co.